Who will be the most successful first-year college football coach in 2022? Now, we've got a whole list of them, and we can, of course, talk about Brian Kelly and Lincoln Riley, et cetera, et cetera, uh, because those are the the two high-profile ones. But do you have any off the top of your head that you think will be really successful in year one right off the bat? Yeah, see, I was I was not even considering guys like Brian Kelly. Because, yes, they're first-year coaches at those positions, at those jobs, but they're not they're not first-year coaches, okay? These are well established. I mean, that'd be like if Bill Belichick left the Patriots and, and you know, went to, to coach the Colts. Like, True. all right, it's his first year there, but he's not the he's not he's not a first year head coach. So they they those weren't even like considerations. All right, so I, I assume the same would be for uh, for Mario Cristobal, right? Like different situation, yeah, I don't, but he's been around the block. He's not the class of those other guys. I know everybody in the media for some reason thinks he is, um, but I you know I don't I don't know I don't see it. I don't see it. <laughs> uh, man. I, there's a couple of guys I'm interested in. I just don't know. Billy Napier has got to be the one I'm most interested in. Will he be the best? I don't know. Florida's just jumped into the belly of the beast, being in the SEC and and with the schedule being out. But he's he's one of the best coaches in the country, in my opinion. That just got a big boy job. Yeah. So that's who I'm most interested to see. That's the only name on the list that that I that I'm really going to be laser focused on. I'm I'm very interested in in Billy Napier, but I think it's going to take some time to like reestablish a culture there, and it's kind of the same thing with Brian Kelly and Lincoln Riley and Cristobal, for that matter. Um, Billy Napier, I think, could be incredibly successful year one right off the bat, but Ooh, I don't, well, we just have to define what success is. I think that like, he could get them back to like nine and three. Okay, well, I yeah, think that but, would be successful. I don't think he could win the SEC East this year by any means. Um, but I think that he can I reestablish. To, I need to see their non-con teams, though, because nine they, wins. They play like, Utah. That means they're beating Tennessee, but they could still lose to LSU. They could still lose to Georgia, and they could still lose, you know, another SEC game. Like, that's – So they so they play, uh, they play Utah at home in their first game. So that okay, so that would be a big non-con win. That would be a big win. Okay. Yeah, that would be a big win. Uh, looking at the rest of Florida's schedule here, da, 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 da. let's see, get that mic closer so I'm not uh, echoing everywhere. So you think if they win all their games but they lose LSU, they lose Georgia. I'm not saying they will lose LSU and Georgia. I'm just saying I'm just going through a happenstance. The highest ranked teams that they're going to play preseason or whatever. Well, here, I've, I've got LSU, the schedule. So they, let's, let's they go. They lose Georgia. And they lose one of either Tennessee or Utah. You would think that would be a successful season. Yeah, I think nine and three with with what Florida just went through. Uh, I I don't think that their expectations are sky high right now because okay. they they understand. I think Florida fans understand that they have got to uh, they got to figure some things out. They got to get back on the recruiting trail. Uh, they are not as talented as a lot of the teams that are going to be playing, uh, especially this season. I'm not, Here's, I'm not a- Here's the beginning I'm of the schedule, by the way. Uh, I'm just—I was just curious. It surprised me a little that that, that was your—that was your take that 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 would be. Uh, yeah, yeah, so. uh, nine and three. I think it's. But successful. I'm okay with that. Yeah, uh, most I'm certainly. the one that says all the time it's not your birthright to win ten games. So yeah, well, they, I, I would agree with that. It shocks me. You, you, we we see that thing. So <laughs> they open with Utah, then they've got Kentucky. Both of those are at home. Uh, they got USF after that, then at Tennessee. Eastern Washington, Missouri, and then they play LSU at home. They've got a bye week before playing Georgia in Jacksonville. Then they play at Texas A&M immediately after Georgia. So that one could be kind oh, of tough. Oh, shit. They have LSU. Okay, now if they win nine games on that schedule, yep, 100%. Yeah. That's, that's not just successful. That's incredible. That's, yeah. I don't yeah. think I don't think there's any way on earth they're doing that. It, it, I could see this team getting around eight and four, nine and three. It all depends on what they do with the quarterback position. I mean, who knows? They got the the recruit. Uh, excuse me, the transfer. God, where's it? Oh, Ohio State from Ohio State. Now, I, I do love Billy name. Napier. Yeah, so. no, 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 certainly. Uh, and so they close out with South Carolina at Vanderbilt, and then they play at Florida State. Who, who knows what to expect out of the Seminoles this year? You know, Mike Norvell going into his third year, he needs a big year. Uh, the fact that they've got that Doke Campbell is is so pretty they got good deal. two basically two actually big non-con team, and they play two of the top three teams from the West. That's a, sure, that's, 
<laughs> it's like, hell, that's a, yeah, they're not that's getting a the schedule. Win, they're yeah. not getting the nine wins. <laughs> that's a stack schedule. And that's schedule. not a knock on Florida, and that damn train a knock on Billy. No, yeah. no, no, for sure. For sure. That's a grind. That's a grind. That's a grind. The other coach that I'm interested in, another big boy, massive program, maybe the biggest program in the history of college football. Uh, we've got a first-year head coach ever at the University of Notre Dame. And, yes, Marcus Freeman. And that, and, and, that's a, and this is a dude that people have been talking about for the last couple of years. That he is a rising star, and, and that is, I think that is true. But first year, lots of stars get, get kind of kicked around their first year. So uh, well, I will tell I'm, you I'm this. very interested to see their schedule ain't easy. The Irish. Their schedule no, ain't no, no. easy. Well, their schedule's never easy. Oh, they, no, no, no. People but, talk about Notre Dame all the time, about, <laughs> oh, they're independent, so they get to make their own schedule. They are a top ten strength of schedule every year, every year. Well, especially on name brand opponent, they they the years sometimes fall uh, like they did last year, where the competition well, is the, not the most difficult. Well, it, but you know, people who talk about how the ACC is really good, you know, the, the, what hurt Notre Dame's strength of schedule was was saying we're going to play eight games against the ACC every year, and now all of a sudden the schedule gets really really soft in certain spots. Oh yeah, all right. That doesn't that doesn't say a whole lot for the ACC, by the way. That's right? true. So. That is true. Uh, so here's what Notre Dame's got: they play at Ohio State, then they've got Marshall and California at home. They play at North Carolina. They got a bye week, then they play BYU in Las Vegas. They play Stanford at home, UNLV at home, at Syracuse, Clemson, Navy in Baltimore, and then they've got Boston College and at USC. Yeah, I mean, it's that, but that's the Notre Dame schedule, though, man. I, I think they schedule hard games all the time. Oh, all yeah. The time. Oh, yeah. No, I, it, I, I wonder uh, if they lose a couple of those games early. Like, obviously, going to Ohio State in week one, oh, uh, yeah. that's, that's, that's rough. Insane. That is rough. That's, but, yeah, you're going into the horseshoe. That's a big deal. And then in week four, you play at North Carolina. Then you play BYU right after that. I mean, you come out of this thing two and three, this thing could spiral. It could absolutely spiral. Uh, Clemson, of course, always difficult uh, playing at USC uh, at the end of the season. Lincoln at the end of Lincoln Riley's first year, uh, that's going to be interesting. So I'm I'm curious to see. I think he could be really really good because the culture. Has, We're not going to judge set. Freeman off of this year, right? So let's say no. for some reason the wheels come off and they do spiral. We're we're not judging Freeman off of one year, right? No, I don't believe so. Okay. I don't believe. I so. didn't think so, but I just wanted to. I just wanted to make sure we were on the same page on that. Yeah. No, no, no. I, I don't. I don't think they would do that. And I, I certainly am not going to judge him off of this. Uh, it depends on what they've got at quarterback, and we still really have no idea. They're they're losing Jack Cohn. I, who knows what they're going to end up looking like? I will say that. Uh, the next ones that I had on this list. Uh, hey, so uh, go ahead and bring this up real quick. Jeff Tedford is back at Fresno. Uh, you know he's been out of out of the game for a couple of years. You think he can come in? You know. With, they got a fantastic quarterback and everything. I mean, does Fresno just kind of keep on rolling? They won nine games last year, uh, upset UCLA. Well, yeah, this, I, I think Fresno is a good school, a good program. They they put some money into that program last couple of seasons, and uh, and they, they they've kind of been a different caliber Mountain West team last couple of years, um, trying to compete for the Mountain West, being competitive in that conference. Uh, I think Tepper will do fine. I think so, too. I think he's going to be just fine. And I don't even know that you would really consider him a, a first-year coach. But, you know. I, the fact that he, yeah, he's just basically taking the job he used to have, you yeah. know. No, you're, uh, you're not wrong about that. Uh, the next one I've got down is Brent Venables at Oklahoma. Uh, getting Jeff Lebby for his offensive coordinator was a massive, massive proposition. And on top of that, you go and get Dylan Gabriel out of the transfer portal. Uh, I think they're going to be fine. Like, I think Oklahoma's going to be really successful. They could probably win the Big 12 again this next year. Oh, you're just saying win the Big 12 first year. Yeah. Woo. I think they right. could. I, I think they'll I think they be good. I think they'll be fine. I, I actually don't have them being that good. But I might be wrong. And this isn't a knock on Venables. I think Venables wants to coach a completely different team than Lincoln Riley built. Oh, yes. I think, think – all right, so, so let's – now Tedford's going to do a lot of what a lot of what Riley does, but but Venables is going to want to be more um, build around the defense. Um, let's play hard nosed tough football. I, I think that takes a little bit of time to transition the culture 
of that team into. It you might I don't think be you right do that overnight. That. Yeah. I don't think you do that overnight, but I could be wrong. I could be wrong. I yeah, just think you, you got to shift the culture. I, I, if 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 Brett Venables is, is if Oklahoma looks anything like the Oklahoma the last five years, six years, I'll just be shocked. Okay, I think Brett Venables would hate himself if he wakes up every day knowing they got to score forty and and hope that they don't give up forty three to win a football game. Yeah, no, you're you're absolutely right, but. Uh, with Jeff Lebby in there, with Dylan Gabriel, with the talent that's that's even still left. I know a lot of it left with Lincoln Riley, but uh, they've still got dudes. they still got guys. I think they could still be really, really good. I don't know that they'll win the Big 12. I'm not going to necessarily predict them to do that. I just – it wouldn't surprise me if they do, right? Like, I, nothing in the Big 12. I think uh, it would surprise me. I do think it would surprise me. Okay, okay. I think the the guys that were at the top of the Big Twelve are losing so much that you know I just I think everybody's get this this conference will be a uh, free for all like I just I think it's going to be crazy absolutely crazy uh, no next. no my boy Dave my boy Dave Aranda about to put a chokehold on it <laughs> I mean they, they're losing a lot this year they are losing a bunch I don't care uh, number I don't care. they didn't have much when he got there it'd be all right number five here Dan Lanning. Uh, Georgia defensive coordinator that took over as the head coach for uh, Oregon when Mario Cristobal left. Uh, look, Cristobal left a ton of talent in the tank there. I think that he could he could really, really surprise some people this year. Um, you know, Kenny Dillingham is the, uh, the new OC. You know, can Dillingham do more? Because people think that there's more talent on that offense than, there, than maybe there really is. Um, but Joe Moorhead wasn't able to get a whole lot out of it. Like, do they? Bo Nix, of course, is the uh, is the quarterback there now. They maybe they surprise some people. What, what do you think about uh, Lanning? Uh, I would need to understand the parameters of success and good. Can they be competitive in the Pac-12? Sure. Uh, non-conference speaking, um, I don't think they're close to good with the national good. Yeah, I mean, you you might be right about that. You might be right. Uh, let's uh, let's roll through some other names right quick just to get a feel on them. Um, you know, Brent Pry at Virginia Tech, uh, former Penn State defense coordinator. Like, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Virginia Tech Maybe. is always I, solid, right? I, they well, they have been. Uh, they they weren't under our, our guy, but I I have. But they're so far away from what they were with Frank Beamer coach that team, and that was our entire childhood and adult life, other than the last you know, five years or whatever. I don't I have no idea what to expect out of out of Virginia Tech. I would like to see the Hokies go back to a, a you know a national power team. You know not that he can't get them there. I just gotta see it because it's been so long since I've kind of taken them serious. Let's uh let's talk about these two right quick. Uh Sonny Dykes taking over TCU. I I think it's gonna take him a little bit of time to build what he wants there. Uh, I I don't know that you can implement that. Like I I will. How about this? We'll compare the two. Rhett Lashley takes over as the head coach at SMU. I think he has more wins in year one than Sonny Dykes does. Uh, yeah, but that's competition, though. Hang on now. That's I would say competition. it's competition as well, but it's also that Lashley runs the exact same thing that Dykes ran, uh, and it was already set up at SMU. Like I think it's but, just going to take no, time. No, 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 no. I'm not going to give Dykes a pass on that. All right, I, and I love Sonny Dykes. I love Sonny Dykes. Okay, you know this. We talked about this. It's yeah. established. Sonny Sonny Dykes' offense is not something that takes years of development and bringing in your guys. This is not going from a a, a wild spread them out team to a hard nosed eye formation run the football team. Okay, you can you can run Sonny Dykes' offense at the flip of the switch. You go in spring practice, teach these guys the offense, and they can run it that next day. This is not a complicated thing. It's not a complex thing. It, it's just not. Okay? It's not. So okay. that offense is going to be what it is day one. Now, will he have the quarterback that he idealistically wants? I don't know. You know, will he have some of the skill players that he idealistically wants? Probably not. But it doesn't, doesn't mean he can't run the offense. It doesn't mean it won't be successful to a level. I just think that the caliber of play in the Big 12 is just more rounded. And, and and I think Sonny Dykes is going to realize he's not walking into the lion's den of the Big 12. But I do think there's some, 
some better defensive coaches out there. Uh, Oklahoma State has put a, a big emphasis on defense. Oklahoma, by hiring Venables, has obviously, I think, going to put a big emphasis on defense. I think, you know, Dave Aranda at, at, at Baylor put an emphasis on defense. I think those guys and, and the defenses around those programs are just going to find ways to shut Sonny down. Because whenever Sonny would play well-coached, high-talented defenses, he struggled. Yeah, no, you are not wrong about that. Uh, that kind when of- he plays teams like Memphis, he, he beat the hell out of them or would swing for the fences with them, just match them point for point. Yeah. When he played teams like Cincinnati, he really got put in the phone booth, and he really, really struggled. You are not wrong about that. Uh, the last one I that I want to bring up. going to give him problems as well. Like oh, that's yeah. another school oh, that, yeah. that'll give him fits that he's going to have to play. So I, I like CCU, but I, I think Sonny's going to be really interesting. Oh, I think so too. I think so too. Uh, the, the last one that I want to bring up, Caitlin DeBoer replaces Jimmy Lake at Washington. Uh, DeBoer was at Fresno. Uh, this is this is what his career has looked like here recently. Uh, DeBoer was the OC under Tedford and then left and was the OC for one season at Indiana, and it was Indiana's best season maybe ever uh, under Tom Allen. And then he leaves to go back to Fresno to take over the head coaching job when Jeff Tedford retires. DeBoer does amazing things on offense, et cetera. Fresno, really good football team last year. He takes over at Washington. I, this is another one of those situations where I think it's going to take a little bit of time to move them from what they were doing offensively I, because they were they were pretty good on defense anyway. But I think this offense is going to take a little bit of time because he's going to have to recruit the guys that he wants. Now you can flip a roster now a lot easier uh, with the transfer portal, and they've done some of that. I just I don't have a lot of faith that this is going to work right off the right off the bat. Yeah, I don't either. But you know, I, I've been wrong about guys before. I mean, they do have quarterbacks. I, I don't think there's a ton of talent in Washington, by the way. That's that's think, what I'm saying. I don't think that Chris Peterson won in spite of talent. That was kind of always his calling card of what he was known for. Is he didn't have to have the greatest guys at Boise to compete because he was going to beat you on scheme. And, and then they just brought in guys that worked with Chris Peterson, but none of those knew how to do what Chris Peterson knew how to do. And yeah. they still never got great talent there. I, I just I think Washington's going to really struggle to win football games. I don't think they help the Pac-12 get stronger. I think you're right. I think you're right. Thanks for listening to the Winning Cures Everything podcast. The website is winningcureseverything.com, and if you want to connect with us, we're on Twitter, at GaryWCE, at Chris B. Giannini, at Winning Cures, or you can email us, Gary at winningcureseverything.com, or Chris at winningcureseverything.com. Subscribe everywhere you need to subscribe, and we'll see you soon.